to January, lunch, and the hooks get ready. Time's going by really fast. So we appreciate your coming, and we also want to thank uh, New Army Garden Club for being our hostess today, and uh, they're helping us in conjunction with this event. So I think it'll be great for them, and great for Mr. Miller, because New Army Garden Club has uh, a lot of uh, interest that was in your heart. So I know they're going to appreciate you. And of course, we always thank Grace for her beautiful music. So now, if you will stand with the Pledge of Allegiance. Attention, the one pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. If uh, you happen to see the article that was in the journal <coughs> introducing, I think, Mr. Miller to us in a long... <laughs> but this, it was very, very interesting, and I'm going to let him tell you more about that, but let me just tell you that he graduated from Baylor University with a degree in Earth Science from the Geology Department and a degree in History from the History Department. His studies included numerous courses in archaeology and anthropology. And since his graduation, he has worked as a farm manager, a restored historical home, restored historical home, and worked in an architectural <laughs> location photographer. Those are Thank you very much for coming today, and we're ready to listen to what you have to say. Welcome him, please. First of all, I want to say that it's critical in Mississippi, especially where my uh, family roots run deep in Marshall County, October Hot, and also you got a bus but especially in Marshall County, where we can trace running back to the late 1830s and the early 1840s. My grandfather on my dad's side graduated from Mississippi State, and my dad spent two years on this before World War II came along and they would come all of them into service. I want to thank uh, Ms. Sissy Bullock and Jill Smith for inviting me here to speak about a subject matter that's very close to me, plus that is fresh off the press. Since my very early years, I've had an interest in archaeology and anthropology, and during my life have collected by every single pamphlet, brochure, site report, and book on the subject matter at hand. For the past 25 years, I've led archaeological tours all up and down the Harpeth River system in Middle Tennessee, showcasing artifacts and drawings that either pertain to the different respective sites or relate to the same time period. This methodology is very important because it makes each and every site come alive. Also, if one carries along broken fragments of terracotta or pottery and flint and let the different individuals on the tour handle these. It brings people closer to not only the people who resided there, but to the people who actually made the artifacts. The hands of the present are reaching back to the hands of the past. One cannot just lead a tour and expect individual sort of uh, information. It just doesn't work that way. Also, if one could have an loud or chunky game demonstrations at a particular site, this is also even better. Up at a, up at a place in, in Nashville at this uh, park, uh, the director there and I have been having talks and we're getting ready to set up a chunky yard. It'll be the first chunky yard ever set up in, in Tennessee at a particular park. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's in the National Park system. But 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 it's all brought together be the first time a a chunk yard there in South Ender Park. And what chunk yard is, it's a yard about 100 feet long and about uh, 30 feet wide and has four corners with sticks painted red. And that's one thing I'll get to a bit later in my book talking about the chunk yard and the chunky players, which my book showcases the first time that the that the games have been played, showcase the game being played in the book. Uh, it's always been described in other books, 
in some books, maybe just the rough game yard that's shown, um, George uh, Gatlin, who was a famous uh, Western artist who was from this country, but he started in Europe and then he came back. Uh, he uh, painted a chunky yard, but it's kind of like on, on a, a high level scenery where you can't see the yard at all, it's just a line, and it shows the chunky player uh, you know, going after the six stone, throwing their, their six at it. But anyway, uh, back to the uh, 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 main line, individuals have been out to me for the last 10 or 11 years try to look on archaeology and anthropology. With most books on the subject matter, they're either too deep or too elementary. I want this book to fall somewhere in the middle, with articles to interest not only the trained professionals, but also the newly interested. I also wanted the artifacts pictured in their true color to show what one should expect to see regarding the various materials used to make the artifacts being discussed. This was never made available to me in books of the time when I started out in our process and it was left up to my imagination to what the particular artifacts look like in color. This is a very, very real disadvantage. Another mechanical that I wanted to have in my book was that I desired to have all available information concerning the artifact posted under under the artifact. Many times in other books, information is either coded or is listed in the back of the book. And I personally hate to flip from the page where the artifact is pictured to the book or even try to decipher the code. And that's what's the matter with this book here and also this book. This book is a, is a very fine book. But the trouble is, though, on the photographs on the front, you know, they just tell you what the style of pottery is, what style of flint. But then you got the way in the back, and it's in code with numbers. And they're not necessarily down back or Some are, some pages are, but some aren't. And uh, so then you got the same the code, and then if you got to go back and see if you have the right number back, back over here. Uh, and then finally, you get the information that you're trying to find. So that's a real uh, disadvantage. Also, in. Uh, this book here, it's also the same way. This one is a little bit better. It has some real fine black white pages and color pages, and tells a little bit about it. But if you want to find more information, you got to way in the back, just way back over here to the back, to where the code system is, like right here. And it tells you more about it. And I, I don't like that way of, of reading the book. It just really uh, kills my soul, but I'm sorry, it's really good. I don't like that. So I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, uh, well, she came up with the idea too. Said she liked, she liked the information either the way it was designed out. So she said, "Why?" Well, said, "I like to be had one time ago. Let's put the information under each and every artifact." So that's what we did. Also, I wanted to fall back a little bit. Uh, when we first started our book, I told my wife that uh, I didn't want you know. I'll put it this way: a lot of your books, uh, a lot of your good color books, are printed in Hong Kong in China. And I didn't want my book printed in Hong Kong, which I, know that, I don't have anything against them or anything. I just wanted to print you you would survive, but it's important for me to have it uh, printed that way. So uh, we looked up different, you know, pre presses, and my, my wife, uh, you know, kind of worked on it, and she, so she's big graduated. I mean, she just she worked uh, tooth and nail, and from early morning to late evening, just, just working on the book. So that would have been a lot to me. And uh, uh, so we had. Uh, Full color print group uh, out of Louisville, Kentucky, do the pre press, and we had Jostens out of Clarksville. You might know them because for years they've been doing school yearbooks, and we had them uh, uh, print the book, and they did a real fine job with it. But anyway, uh, getting back, uh, uh, another mechanical that I wanted to have in my book was that I already have all the information certain artifact, post on the artifact. I want to miss that again. And uh, so, uh, so that was important to me to have it the way in the text. Uh, also, one of the photographs in the book to be crisp and clean, as opposed to what one sees as quote unquote normal, which really is normal uh, in a great amount of in a great amount of books that, that are out there. My wife and I uh, uh, will spend a great amount of time not only setting up our photograph hardware or equipment, but are very careful with the right and correct lighting. So the finest photograph can possibly be captured on film. Yes, I'm still a film man and not a, a digital believer. I do not believe in digital photography. 
it is still a proven fact that the best pictures, the best pictures are captured on film. I might have said it was deeper color. <coughs> there are several firsts that are found within this book. <clears throat> Number one, the first time that a book has been published on Southeast archaeology in 50 years, 50 years, and with color plates. Number two, the first time that chicken players have ever been pictured in a book actually playing the game. And I'll show you this right here. I know some of you probably can see but this, but when you talk later, you can uh, see it right here. Hold up. Uh, I had this uh, friend at Montgomery Bell Stevens Hall Park that I've known for quite a number of years, and uh, I'll talk to her uh, about this project. And uh, there's not this guy blue, she's going to wire. She said, uh, I'm an artist, not a very good one, but I think I may even help you out. I said, Really? I said, that sounds fantastic. So I told her what we wanted to do, and I know she took it back in the back, being cut down. This is the picture she did right here, showing the chunky players. Like I said earlier, you know, the game of chunky has been explained in a book, but you really can't see the layout. As I said earlier, also George Calvin, you know, did a painting of it, but he just did like a line drawing, so he didn't really show the yard or anything. So like I said that was kind of a, a disadvantage. Uh, number three, the first time that the two most famous quarries in the South have ever been pictured in a book together. There are three famous quarries in the South. Question: Can y'all name the three quarries that are famous in the South? No. The Southeast. <laughs> Well, one of them is the Vacla Quarries of Arkansas, or Hot Springs. And uh, they've been mining that place, the Aboriginals had, ever since Paleolithic times, from about 10, 12, 20,000 BC up to through Mississippian times. And the reason they were, they were mining Vacla is because there is no Flint in Arkansas. But, but the Vacla is, is a good. I'll say, well, sometimes it could be better than Flint, but sometimes it's not. But anyway, but it was a good substitute for Flint, put that way. Another one is the, the famous North Flint quarries up near North Tennessee, uh, about 50 miles, 40 50 miles west of Nashville. And it's a fantastic place also. And uh, then there's a third one called the Rile Lake quarries of Western North Carolina, where they don't be Flint either, but there's a material called Rile Lake. I'm not too familiar with it, but it works real well for. Flint arrow points and tools and scrapers, things of that nature. And then there's one way out west that's even uh, probably more famous called Elevates Flint Quarries, where they mine that place also for about, oh, I guess maybe said Pale Times also through Mississippian Times. Another thing I want to uh, showcase on the book talking about quarries, when I first started reading some of these other books about quarries, uh, they didn't really explain about the quarry, they would just tell about how. The ends we use in the quarries, you know, for the flint uh, points and tools and <coughs> scrapers of a different nature. So when I was pretty young, a lot younger, but that way, uh, the way I visited quarry was, well, one time my dad took me to a, a rock quarry up near Nashville. And I saw I visited a big high bluff like this, you know, where they had pulled the dirt away and you had this big exposure of a face rock. And so I visited a quarry like that where they would, you know, cap it off and then they would crunch up the different sections and, and, and portions and, and parcels to use on gloves and roadways. So that's why I was envisioning. And that's, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't really envision anything else from other books that I read. So I told my wife, I said, you know, I said, that, that's what has vanished to a lot of people. So I said, I, I, I don't want to do that in my book. I want to have something a, a, a little different. So uh, what I did here, here again, you know, I'm going to later and uh, see these pictures, but I told her I want to, um, uh, I want to showcase the quarries, you know, the, the way they really are. I know it's hard to see from the back of the back, but uh, I'll see where you later and see it. But anyway, this picture here shows some of the exposure of the backlight uh, rock that's coming through the earth, and sometimes it was exposed itself, sometimes it would not. And then here, this is spillage coming down the hillside where they, you know, mined for years and years and years. We're talking like, you know, 10 or 15,000 years. And so you think while people mine this quarry and uh, going in there and, and uh, where they shave off the, the flint, you know, uh, from the points and the knives and the tools, and you take that plus many thousand years plus many aboriginals doing the work, you have just many, many uh, sites, you know, at, at these quarries. Uh, another uh, famous quarry that I just mentioned earlier was the Dover Flint Quarry. 
and, and that's this one right here. These four, and this one here, we're showing all the spillage coming down the hillside. And this also has never been shown to me, but you won't find it in any other archaeological text or anywhere whatsoever. Uh, this is Rodden Parrish, who uh, did the study. He's a real friend of mine at the University of Memphis. And I knew you can't tell from back in the back, but he pin dotted with orange dots each little, each little place where he found a little bit of a quarry. And some of the pin dots even run together, which is really fantastic. But he had one called Ridley Quarry Site, one called Cross Creek, one called Country Ridge, one called Thompson Hollow. Anyway, it's just, I've been there several times. It's just an amazing place. But so much more, like I said, that's what true quarry is really about. It's not the spillage, it's not a rock face like a lot of people would imagine, it's, it's spillage coming down the hillside where they, where either the, uh, the adult flint or the backpack exposed itself or if it did, they actually dug into the ground two three feet deep to get at the source to where they could pull this rock out and then, you know, make it into arrow points and, 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 and knives and tools and things of, of that nature. Um, and then another thing that I want to uh, uh, share with y'all is that the uh, number four is the first time that three ceremonial copper axes in East Tennessee have been every photograph in color. Now they were photographed in tribes of slumber in black and white, but you really couldn't see the tail or anything. And it was kind of a, you know, it just it wasn't a good photograph at all. But anyway, um, and in tribes of, slumber, tribes of slumber it was by Thomas M. N. Lewis and Madeleine Nieberg. It was done in black and white in 1960, and then printed several times since then up to about 2001. And these kind of racks being in color showcase not only how they were originally a shiny brown, and also how they had changed to a stained green through oxidation, but also shows the stains, that this report the stains from the cane matted in which they were wrapped. And see that, and we show that well in the black and white photograph. Another point I wanted to accomplish was to have articles in the book in accordance with archaeology, like, quote, dated of artifacts and also uh, a, a visit to the museum. <clears throat> American Indian artifact shows certificates of authenticity and provenance that one, that one would not find in other texts and where one could be a deeper understanding of the different sections of archaeology. At this time, I would like to share uh, some of the art that here with you. I thought it was important that uh, you won't find it here that you won't find it in, in other places. Let me start with here. Uh, uh, okay, this is the first one. A visit to the museum to see the real thing. Do not believe everything in the museum is authentic. Some of our facts of antiquity are reproduction because there are no available monies to purchase accredited pieces. Also, museum personnel are only human, and mistakes that are made where curators have mistakenly purchased or been given false items to display. This unfortunate occurs not only at art museums, but also modest ones. Honor is preserved where either personnel or the curators come across the error and it has been corrected. According to the Association of Art Museum Directors, anything pertaining to the museum can be deaccessioned if it is determined to be false or fraudulent. Integrity is not preserved in museums where the curator is not seen fit to correct the shadowy item because saving the face is more important. It seems to be the case that the line gets crossed more often at the smaller museums in small towns because of familiarity between museum curator and local collectors. One fact has to do with mess science, while the other has to do with, for whatever the reason, poison in the museum in order, now get this now, in order to validate certain artifact or artifacts. The poison spreads when unsuspected newly interested collectors visit the museum enthusiastic about increasing their knowledge by viewing what they think to be verifiable artifacts. They are unable to assert collections intended by greedy donors or lenders of artifacts to the museum whose ulterior motive is to give credibility and rare value to the false artifacts they provide to the museum. The myth gets spread and the novice gets burned. Nor are novices later able to assert truth from fiction when they attempt to study about their collectibles. Then how does one know where to look to find accurate information? 
reports, articles, <coughs> books, booklets, and so forth produced by state and collegiate archaeologists are a good place to start. Of course, for the novice, some of these resources may be too deep. Archaeologists affiliated with these divisions are often willing to share information and answer questions interested individuals have. They can also provide a list or titles of resources available to the main marketplace. There is a partial list of sources individuals can trust at the end of this book. After studying agri resources, let's go back to the museum and discern the real things. Or better yet, go with a novel friend and learn about the various artifacts, their uses, and how to discern the real thing. Another thing I wanted to share with you that's really important has to do with provenance. Provenance. Does it affect the validity and value of an artifact? Provenance. One, origin, source. Two, the history of ownership of a valued object or a work of art or literature. Merriam Webster's Plato Dictionary, 10th edition, 1993. How does provenance get separated from a fine American Aboriginal <coughs> Indian artifact? First, Many collectors make no attempt to keep provenance with their artifact. And when the original finder dies, or his mind becomes clouded, then the very next owner receives no provenance and has no provincial record to go with the artifact. I have some flint knives and at other points that my grandfather and his brother found on the old family farmstead at Law Hill, Mississippi, 14 miles southwest of High Springs. When my grandfather's mind was fresh, who laid the provenance of the artifacts he and his brother had found? and told me the story of how they were used for their amusement as toy soldiers. I wrote down this information and, in the, and at that time they wrapped up with artifacts until I was able to procure a suitable display frame for them. I then transferred the information to the back of the display frame to keep the provenance with the artifacts. Secondly, some antiquarians want to possess Aboriginal American artifacts for the sake of the art of the artifact. They do not seem to care about the provenance. There have been, and still are, several of these kinds of individuals who collect almost anything and everything, just as long as it has either beauty or value, or preferably both. They do not wonder about the average <coughs> artifact as to its usage or to its place in archaeological text. Their only concern lies with the intrinsic or monetary value of the particular Aboriginal artifact. <coughs> Thirdly, there are classic collectors, mostly sellers, who like to misrepresent, especially concerning a fine artifact. Some persons who have a decent artifact from a non-strip site will purposely, purposely change the provenance to a more famous site, thus in the minds adding value to the artifact. This behavior destroys the provenance of an artifact. Another angle follows when presumably an artifact or artifacts have been found by an artifact hunter while a morally trespassing on someone's property. The artifact hunter or hunters want to throw off any suspicion of their illegality and therefore will perfectly demean the artifact or artifacts by changing the provenance. This is a treacherous tactic and one that has ruined some beautiful, authentic, authentic now, American Indian artifacts because of covetousness and greed. One thing about provenance, if a person has learned about average artifacts, most of the time, true provenance, this is, this is good here, most of the time, true provenance can be researched and determined. One has to be well informed about archaeological territory, context, and of course records to be able to find the truth about artifacts where either the provenance has been lost, forgotten, or even changed. Applying these resources, unprovenance artifacts can be tracked as to culture and secrets and to type and form. Average artifacts without provenance will only have value as objects dark. Their value will only have half or less than half of provenance artifacts. And it's not just Indian, but Civil War or furniture or anything of that nature. Um, if you aren't familiar with Edgy's Roadshow, I was really hooked on that, on that show for quite a number of years. And what they really used to be, along with artifacts, was that uh, about two three years ago, there was a guy that had a fantastic high boy. I think it was high boy or what? Uh, I'm sorry, it's just drawers. Sorry, it's a high chest drawers. I'm sorry, I was uh, mistaken. And it was just beautiful. I mean, it was a blue jar before. And we had gone to the family through different generations. Had the original uh, brass and everything, and the stain with the original. It was original. And uh, the Scandinavian City had it. 
and they had a weapon on top and hit on TV up there, and that's what we told the that's what we told the people at the Edge Road Show. That's what he was doing it for, just to you know, have a little platform for his little TV. But anyway, so well, he brought to the show and the, and the Keto brothers, who were past masters of old furniture, uh, were kind of describing the, the furniture to him. And but in my book, I'll bring this out too, because that also goes along with archaeology. But the Keto brothers, uh, as as well versed as they are, they also depend on others. You know, they want to get other people's opinions. It's always good to get as many opinions as you possibly can on take artifact or some more fact, because there's a lot of fake somewhere else out there, totally not believe it or not. And also fake furniture, that's fake everything. There's also fake coins and fake stamps. There's fake everywhere. But anyway, so even they depend on others. And uh, they even uh, went back, well, at this Edge of Trove show, they always have a big trailer. And it's just a full of just a fantastic, most fantastic, beautiful uh, books of, of libraries and from different parts of the country that you can possibly imagine. And they also source those out. And if they, if they go back even further, they go back to, to the, uh, the uh, Library of Congress. And if you all know, the core books of the Library of Congress came from Thomas Jefferson's library. <coughs> but anyway, so, so they go back, they don't, you know, uh, when they're talking to people, you think on this road show that, that you know, they were talking to them, but no, they sourced out other people and other books and other places. But anyway, we get back to these furniture, uh, the Kim Brothers were really astounded by it and everything, and they said it was original, this, you know, the same had been messed with or anything, and the wood was original, the brass original, and they flipped to the back, and the guy was so proud of it that uh, the, the guy took a red pencil, and he had uh, marked his name and, and the, the, the place and the date and everything. So, uh, most of made sure the Kim Brothers said, this piece is so much so, so of a knockout, said, it's like $100,000, $100,000 <coughs> okay. So some weeks down the line, they were in Philadelphia. And believe it or not, they had the twin. <laughs> this guy had the, had the twin to this like, piece. And so um, uh, they were bragging about it. They had the original brasses and everything. And had you know, the original woodwork. Hadn't been played with or anything. And, uh, but in this case, stuff in the family, it had gone through several families, very unfortunately. But that happens sometimes. You can't help it. But anyway. So the kid was having a little fun with this guy. They said, well, I said, uh, we told him about this piece. He said, what do you think it's worth? He said, oh, I know exactly what it's worth. He said, said go ahead and twin to this <laughs> back, up in, back up in New York City. And um, it's worth $100,000. He said, go said, that's worth $100,000. So mine's worth $100,000. Kid Bro said, wait a minute, wait a minute. So they flipped to the back. And guess what? The, the guy probably who, who made it, and they said it probably came out of the same wood shop. More likely like they did. And the guy probably also in this case took a red pencil and put his name, date, and the whole nine yards. He was so proud of it. But because it went through so many hands, you know, different families, that when people would take their fingers and you have to ask me if anybody or not, and uh, that's why a lot, a lot of times on rare books, I have a, a, a book friend up in uh, Nashville who runs over a bookstore. I'm a soccer mm -hmm. community, but anyway. And um, uh, he has a glass case that's so tall and so wide and everything. And he only lets three people look at that showcase, you know, to peruse the books. And I'm one of the three. But even at that, he makes me uh, put on surgical gloves <laughs> so I can you know, put the pages because he only uh, said he get up getting on these real books. But anyway, so get back to this um, real tall uh, uh, uh the, the, the information was not there. Very unfortunately. And so the Kim Bros were real sad about it. They said, well, said, we can almost say this piece came from the original wood shop, but we can't certify it because, you know, that there's uh, there's no information here. And so uh, the value gets went down to fifty thousand. Because the rent's back in half. It was real sad, but the other things happened. Uh, another thing I want to uh, bring out for uh, read your one of the sections of the book. Uh, I have this, uh, uh, this friend who's a retired archaeologist named uh, John Broster. And he, he, he knows people are archaic more than anybody else in the Southeast. He, he's just a real strategic fellow. And uh, for the past, I guess maybe before he retired, the last 30 years, he'd been photographing all the paleo points, meaning points that go back 10, 12, 15,000 years, the Clovises, the, um, the Cumberlands, and fluid points of that nature from North Mississippi, North Alabama. Uh, West Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky, uh, North Georgia, places like that. 
and he has he has quite a collection of, of these photographs. Just really amazing, and, and uh, he, he not he not only photographed them, but he measured them and everything. It's just it's really beautiful. But anyway, during the course of events, he told us on the phone one time. Uh, he said, Marty, I ran into a situation. He said, I know it's hard to believe it. He said, you may think I'm cold and callous, but he said, I'm sorry, but he said, I have, I have certain divisions I've go by, I have certain lines I, I've drawn for myself and photographing and, and, and uh, measuring all these points. But he said, I want to tell you a little story. He said, the guy came to him and said, John, he said, you've got to come to, to, to my place. He said, I've knocked out Cumberland. It's just fantastic. It's about five, six, six inches long and I know you're studying all these all these flip points from the southeast, and mm -hmm. you're photographing, drawing up, you know, and drawing, doing the measurement of everything, and, and uh, find as much history as you can about them. Said, uh, I want you to come photograph. So, my my friend who's hired now, John Poster, said, I'm glad to. So he goes to the guy's house, and he's in the process of looking over this piece, and he said, Marty, he said, guess what I ran into? I said, I don't know what what happened. He said, Well, he said it's, it was very sad. He said, this point was as right as rain, right as rain, but it was in a showcase of puffer pieces, and some were out my face. And so he said, he told the guy, he said, I'm sorry, he said, I have my divisions, and I have my lines that I've set from my belief system here, and photograph all these points for that, and he said, I cannot photograph yours. And the guy got really irritated, my head, he owned it. And uh, he said, why, John, why? <coughs> He said, you said it's real. I mean, you, you've looked at it with a real, you know, high power loop and everything else that you've carried around the pocket. And you, and you, you say it's real, it's a thing in every way. And you won't, you won't photograph it or, or even record it. Why? He said, well, he said, because it's severely tainted. Because the point is in a frame with other questionable pieces and also some of their out and out fakes. He said, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. He said, I, I won't measure it, I won't photograph it. it, 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 it he says, it's sad. It's a great point. If it's authentic every way, but he said it's, it's totally trashed. He said, "I'm sorry, that's the way it is." Okay, but you don't have down the line. John Bosch gets another call, and uh, this guy says, "John said uh, I have this beautiful common point." He says, "I understand your photograph points, yes, and and your your cute measurements, yes, and your little always measurement the points, yes." And he said, "You got to come photograph this point for beautiful common point. It's just so fantastic." He said, "You just, you got to have it on record." Okay, so John Brosher goes and this this new guy, okay, who has his common point. Guess what? John Brosher said, I'm sorry. He said, I can't photograph it. I, I'm not going to record or anything. And uh, this guy said, this new owner of the point said, why not? And he said, well, because I know from, from whence it is laid. He said, I'm sorry. He said, it, it's, it's a trash to point. He said, it's authentic. He asked it away. But, he said, uh, uh, I just can't record it or anything. He said, because I don't know when it came. And, and the guy got really irritated, really mad. He tried to use some proof of language with John, you know, very unfortunately. And uh, he said, well, I don't understand. He said, I've removed this authentic point from these countries and fakes. <laughs> John Bolter <laughs> said, I'm sorry. He said, I have my rules very much. I have my mind upon everything. He said, I'm sorry. It's totally ruined. Totally ruined. And that's the way things are sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, so kind of along the same line, I wanted to share something else with you here. I won't read this whole thing because it's too long. And yes, uh, I didn't mean for it to be so deep in my book. But anyway, but uh, since it has to do with uh, this area, uh, I wanted to include it not just because of this area, but uh, also uh, it's, it's cutting edge technology have to do with artifacts. And uh, it could be used in other uh, situations also. It's called a, a new method of dating. Infrared laser. I now have a hard time with this word <laughs> all the time. Spectroscopy. 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 Sorry. I was at a tough time with that word. But anyway. But anyway, this might interest y'all, especially uh, you, Jill. But anyway, um, I'll skip this. A few paragraphs, not a little bit, but to where it will bring it into focus. Uh, every North American archaeologist dream is a method of data artifacts directly. One that is one, non destructive, two, rapid, three, repeatable, and four, affordable. Currently, artifacts are dated by associated with charcoal, that is to say, radiocarbon dated, or by association with soil particles that have accumulated light. 
optically stimulated luminescence. Both data methods are non-destructive and repeatable. However, they are slow and very expensive. Here I intend to discuss infrared laser Tell me how to get in soon. Thank you. <laughs> a method of rubbing data still in its infancy, but still on cutting edge. But when mature, just be uniformly appreciated and applied. ILS is the brainchild, and I get this now, of David Hunter Wally, an eccentric inventor who works out of the kitchen of a modest clapboard home in the rural community of Dorset. <laughs> Near Fulton. You know, you know, I'm not Yeah, Northwest Mississippi. Dave holds a patent for this archaeometric technique called the Wally 2012, which is unique because of broad applicability to archaeological objects. Dave, like most collectors of ancient artifacts, has confronted the problem of fakes. For some class of objects, detecting fakes is challenging. Data is, re is required. <clears throat> to sort authentic pieces from later copies. Standard methods of determined age, such as real carbon data and thermal luminescence data, or TL, are costly, destructive, slow, and beyond the means of common men. Two, these techniques cannot be applied in all cases. I recall when even some years ago discussing with Dave the challenge of establishing the age of artifacts. I noted his determination to do something about it. And a few months later, he telephoned me and described what he thought was an ideal technique for authenticating and relative dating. I was witnessing the birth of infrared laser spectroscopy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I thought ILS. <laughs> it says that these, these days, lasers are the best source of narrow band with energy used to stimulate fluorescence in atomic bonds. Infrared lasers generate fluorescence, as well as, or better than, laser beams of shorter wavelengths in the visible spectrum. Analysts, however, have observed an unwelcome side effect known as Stokes scattering. Stokes scattering swamps fluorescent light signals, making graphs difficult to read. Infrared laser beams are particularly good at causing Stokes scattering. Stokes scattering occurs when infrared energy causes high energy of electrons that have been trapped within atomic structures. Because of collisions with radioactive particles to fall back to lower energy state and give off energy, frequently in the form of visible light. An old weathered rock, especially if stimulated by an infrared laser beam, will be seen within our darkened room to glow briefly, but intensely. Dave Wally realized that dark scattering offers a straightforward means to determine whether or not the surface of an artifact has been exposed to radioactive particles. If more electrons had accumulated on an artifact's surface than elsewhere within it, then clearly the artifact had been exposed for a lengthy period and was genuine. A moderately made artifact, on the other hand, would show no difference in the map of Stokes scattering between its interior and surface. The surface of a freshly made artifact has had no opportunity to be affected by radioactive particles Within, within a natural environment. And electrons have not been concentrated within traps at its surface. Skip on down a little bit. It says, uh, applying the beam of a one watt infrared laser to the surface of an ancient arrowhead for one second is sufficient to generate a measurable amount of visible light. Using a photo multiplied couple device, the light can be registered as a curve. The area under this curve is the best measure of light intensity. However, in practice, one just records the numerical value of the peak of the curve. An average value for five or six applications of a laser to, in capital letters, each side of the overhead is required for a meaningful result. If time and money were no object, one would prefer to apply the laser beam 50 to 60 times to both phases of an overhead and to average the results. But it was so precision would increase the standard deviation of average value would decrease to plus or minus five percent and perhaps e even less. It's important to measure both sides of a flat object, both sides of a flat object like an arrowhead, as the side facing up when they buried in the earth was wet more often 
It's going to pour way more often by the rainwater with dissolved radon. One, we expect this upward facing side to yield a higher average light value than the downward facing side. Experimentally, we often do observe a difference between sides. Therefore, average sides from both sides are combined for a single result. And then let's keep on down a little bit. It says, uh, to, to obtain accurate light values from air heads at different ages, one must be sure that none have been heated strongly or burned. Modern forest fires might have shallowly buried artifacts strongly causing an unknown number of electrons in traps to fall back to lower energy states, releasing light, and skewing measured values. Burned artifacts will appear less ancient than they really are. For many collectors, it is enough to know that an artifact is a genuine antiquity, not a later fabrication. For her heads, if light values measured by ILS are uniform everywhere on each face and for both faces, our suspicions are aroused. To be even sure that an airhead is a fake, one should measure light values both within the radon damage <coughs> zone at the rock surface and also within the unweathered zone deeper inside the airhead. In order to measure light deep within the airhead, cutting into it might seem necessary. Dave Wally and I are strongly opposed to such destructive acts. Therefore, Dave developed the technique of, quote, virtually focusing, unquote, a laser beam. This technique, whose mechanics are still not understood, enables an operator to measure light deep within raw material and in a couple letters without any influence from the layers through which it passes. No chipping or cutting of an area head is required. This revolutionary discovery is outlined in David Hunter Wallace's patent for the ILS system. Someday, perhaps virtually focusing laser beams will be used in surgery to target diseased tissues. The healthy tissues through which the laser beams pass will be less strongly affected. Another rapid test that confirms suspicions by an artifact's authenticity is to apply a laser beam or a <coughs> strong energy source at the blue end of the visible spectrum. Biogenic organisms fluoresce and invade the blue light. And ultraviolet, a behavior that has been well known in microbiologists for 20 years. Airheads that are weathered and ancient harbor bacteria and their byproducts. Therefore, a truly ancient airhead, a Fort Payne chart or other rock that is quote unquote tasty to bacteria will glow yellow, orange, or red in some blue light. Dave Wally offers a commercial device that enables the user to take fluorescence at the surface of an ancient airhead. This device is known as an archoscope, but I've dubbed it the Wally scope. Wally scopes have been used to detect fluorescence within cracks in the glaze of ancient Chinese portals and stoneware, sparing collectors from making bad purchases. Modern copies will exhibit no such fluorescence. They never were buried within tombs. And the last thing I want to uh, bring out is, is this, and I'm sorry to say it, but, it, but it's, it's really true. Uh, there's a lot of uh, good information online, there's a lot of bad information online. There's a lot of good artifacts, whether it's Indian or Civil War or good furniture is online. There's a lot of bad you know, information about Indian artifacts, Civil War and furniture online. And one has to be very, very discerning. One thing that kind of gives away on, on people who fake, uh, they kind of want to leave their mark behind somewhere on particular artifact with in the Civil War or on a piece of furniture. And also, they're more apt to make their fake better than what's been found, you know, anywhere else in an archaeological text. Uh, a, a few years ago, there was a, um, a cache, a, a presumed cache, Let's see, right on the information here. That was found uh, up around, uh, I think it was around Saris Lake, but anyway. And what it would tell was, it tell, this was online too, a picture online. And very unfortunately, Mississippi, I had it as a local on the top for quite a long time until someone, uh, and it wouldn't be, but if someone finally told them that they didn't rip that off the logo because it, it wouldn't factual. But anyway, uh, what it would tell was, it tell three blades, and I think, uh, they were pretty long too. I forget what the measures were, but anyway, uh, they were pretty lengthy. And two of them were made out of Burlington chart, 
and then they had, uh, I think, uh, three banner stones. I think one was but eight, eight inches long, which was just ungodly. It really was because uh, all your bastards, your true bastards, will be different designs, but they'll be more kind of blocky. They won't have a link to them. Because in my book, uh, I, I talked to the I noted uh, uh, person who, who's, a, who's a an authority on baritones and ladles and their, their usage. Uh, that lives up, up in Montana way. But anyway, and he said, Marty said, uh, I know the baritones of which you speak. He said, totally false because he said, if you had a long baritone like that, it would be totally nonsensical to, to use on that ladle. He said, it would, it would throw the you know, the, 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 the proper usage of, of that level off, you know, of, of, of the guy using it. And so he said it'd be just totally wrong for it. He said, as you know, Mark, some of your bathrooms are blocky. Different designs are blocky, kind of. Well, you got one on that level that's on, on the wall there, uh, Joe. But anyway, so, uh, but this was, it had great length and everything. And, and uh, of course, you know, uh, I talked with uh, some archaeologists at Cobb Institute that I know real well, and <coughs> some others. At, at other places, at the University like Alabama and UT. And I said, uh, as a question, I, I said, how many fancy barristones do you have? And you know what the answer was? None. I, and I said, well, too, but a little bit. They said, well, I said, most of them, like I said, Marty, you, as you know, it's a race, most of them are blocky, and they're just kind of nondescript. And uh, they said, that's the way most of them find Mississippi and Tennessee and, and uh, Arkansas and, and Southern Kentucky. They said, they're not fancy at all, but I'm not sure it's imagination. And they knew that. Unfortunately, that uh, those that found uh, up at uh, Sarge Lake were all false, and it was sad they had been used by Stephen Smith for a while as a logo, which finally got ripped off, which was, I'm glad to see that. But anyway, uh, so things like that happened. But anyway, and then so also at an earlier time, you know, uh, there's something else that's been going on too is the, is the, is the, the manufacture of modern uh, flute points. And um, uh, that's, that's really sad and, and a travesty. Um, and here again, uh, they don't want. They want to go past uh, what is actually found in archival text. So what they'll do, they'll make great lengthy uh, fluid points, whether it's a close or a common or some that nature, and they'll even go so far as, as just serrate them. Which uh, you don't find serrates on, on a uh, on a common or, or a clovis. Also, your common close points uh, are, don't have uh, almost a great length in one time. I think max on a, on a clovis, which I have in my collection, is about five inches long, but it's been. Uh, it's been damaged where it hit a mammoth bone, and that's what uh, smart question it hit. And that's why it got damaged. And then um, also, I think it was your common ones. I think the longest one that out there, I think, is about just a little over six inches. But what the deal is, uh, on your on your fake foot points, they have sharpened points. You know, almost like like needle nose points, and uh, that, that's not typical. Whereas on your true pillow points, they're more kind of I don't want to describe this, but they're more kind of rounded off. They're kind of just dull. A little bit, and the reason they're dull a little bit, rounded off, is because when the pill people were going out on a hunt, you know, there was no promise they were going to come back. And uh, they, they first, in the pill point, you know, they, they first uh, had this their main weapon. It was it was one shaft with a point on it, and then later, because uh, some of them were getting killed that way, because they have to get close and just shove the whole mechanism into a. Uh, a, a cave bear or a big mastodon, which which they had right in this type of woods and also Tennessee, they lost the mechanism. So they, later on, they invented what they called a four shaft and a shaft. So they had some four shafts with with uh, pinpoints on them. They put back here in the quiver so they could pull one out and then just stick it on the on the main shaft and then just hit the mastodon with the cave bear and then yank back and leave the leave the, the four shaft and point in the cave bear and the, or the mastodon. Then they could pull back here again and pull out another. You know, four shafts to go on the main shaft and just to go again, you know. But anyway, so, and, and this, this has been tried in modern times, modern text, where they've taken tough hides, you know, that resemble the pill animals from a long time ago. And with these rounded points, you know, that with the people round them off a little bit, they build a little bit, that the point will penetrate and penetrate really well into these, in these tough hides and hit bone. Uh, whereas whereas the, the sharper points have new tips. What they do, they break on impact. You know, really just they hit, 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 the, hit the tough, uh, the, the skin, the hides of, of animals. And so therefore, if that's what happened, they would have failed hunts. Um, another thing that you have to imagine too, back in pill times, people look around and say, hey, we find this pill point, you know, under the ground, the woods, everything, the trees. And they, uh, th they're thinking that, you know, uh, that this is the same thing the Indians saw. Well, no, that's not true. 
This whole environment from North Mississippi to West Tennessee and North Tennessee were all different, and even North Alabama. You look at your day, you see broken trees. And you know, it's, it gets pretty warm in summer, pretty cold in winter. But anyway, but in Pale Towns, 10, 12,000 years ago, the, uh, and you probably know this, GL, but anyway, but the ice sheet uh, was as far south as Cowell, Illinois. And by the time you got up on, on the crust of it, it was about a mile thick in places. And so all that cold air was coming down here like crazy. And when archaeologists uh, go through these sites, and they, they go through with their flotation device, whereas they can uh, take the soil samples and, and uh, uh, pour it down through different filter systems, uh, they have found out that instead of all the trees right here, that we had a, a, a mixed uh, conical forest, uh, uh, you know, of uh, super um, spruces and hemlocks and stuff like that. It was hard to believe that that's what North Tennessee and, and West Tennessee and Middle Tennessee and North Bama look like, but that's what, that's what it looked like. And then we went through all the thermal, as you know, Jill, about that also, uh, through about middle of the archaic times. We got a little warmer, and then got a little cool again, and then toward the middle of the times, we got more to the uh, weatherization that, that we have now.